Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here again today on our YouTube channel for episode number 872. Well, we have got a great episode for you today. We are revisiting the business of trapping, trapping nuisance animals. We're heading out to Virginia, and we're going to be speaking with Peter Dalton from Hunt Country Wildlife Removal. He'll be coming on to share some tips, some advice, some mistakes he's made and a really actually a very exciting story of how his business is developing. Really enjoyed this interview and we're going to get it started for you right now. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Matt. You bet. Hey, it's my pleasure and uh, looking forward to the conversation. I, you know, I've got a list of I've got a list of topics I like to cover, small businesses and agriculture I like to cover, and I was running down that list, and I had not talked about trapping in quite some time or nuisance animal removal or anything like that, so I really appreciate you agreeing to do it. Yeah, hey, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about you to start. So where are you talking to us from? Where do you live? So I'm in Loudoun County, Virginia right now. Okay. And what part of the state is that in Virginia? So that's Northern Virginia. Um, if you if you if anybody's ever flown into uh, Dulles International Airport, I'm about uh-huh. 45 minutes west or so from there. So. Oh, okay, all right. I so I I have a very close friend who lives in Broadlands, which has got to be. Oh close. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's very close. Yep. Okay. About 25, 30 minutes from me. Okay. I was out there. I did a big East Coast trip two year, uh, 2017. So I was I was going to Farm Aid, which was in Hartford, Connecticut. And I had a media pass to that, but I flew into National in Washington D.C. and met, went and met with uh, National Farm Bureau, and then went and visited uh, my friend and her family, and then actually drove over to West Virginia from Broadlands, and then north up to Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, and spoke to an FFA chapter. So uh, I must have must have driven right through the heart of where you live. Yeah, you you probably went right through here. Yeah, what a pretty area. I always, uh, anytime I have anybody on from Virginia, I always tell tell them that uh, Virginia is always in my top three places of I, where I'd like to farm someday. Awesome, yeah, it, it's definitely pretty country out here. We we've been out here for well, out in in this house in the country for about five years, and we okay. absolutely love it. And did you grow up in Virginia? You've been there your whole life, or did you come in from somewhere pretty, else? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I, I was born in, in the Chicago area, um, moved to Pennsylvania, and was there for a few years. But I've been here for twenty years, so I kind of you know, almost as native as they come. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, you and so it's you and, and your family, who's in your family? So, um, my wife, Claudia, and then we have a 10 month old daughter uh, named Evelyn. Oh, very cool. Well, congratulations. New daughter. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. First one. So very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Good for you. And you live on a, a, a piece of acreage. Is that right? Yeah, we have uh, three acres here. Um, so we're, we're, we joke and call ourselves a micro farm. You know, we got the chickens, we're doing meat birds. Uh-huh. Uh, we have a couple rabbits. So, you know, just trying to garden, uh, be as self-sufficient as we can, you know. Yeah, very cool. And is this something that, that you and your family have been involved in for your whole life or is this something new with you? Um, so my dad was always a big, uh, a gardener. Um, but my wife is, is, uh, kind of the driving factor behind the, the garden. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not a big gardener, but yeah, I mean, it's mostly just me and my wife. Uh, not many people in my family do it. It's just kind of something that we took on and we really enjoy. So oh, that's great. Okay. Very cool. Well, we're going to be talking about your business here coming up in a second, which is uh, hunk Hunt Country Wildlife Removal. Did I get the right? The, right. Okay. Yep. Hunt Country. And uh, you got the shirt on there, so that's great. You've, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're, uh, yeah. you're branding yourself. That's awesome. Good for you. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about what life looks like for you right now. So you and your wife have this three acres. You're, you're kind of being self-sufficient on that um, and out in the country. And then you've got a full-time job in addition to the business. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, I'm in uh, technology sales. Um, so that's, that's my full-time, that's my full-time job. Okay. What is technology sales? Um, so basically what I do is I sell, um, it's called the internet of things. So it's cellular connectivity. Um, so anytime anybody wants to connect a device, let's say other than a cell phone, um, that's kind of where I come in and we provide the connectivity. Um, and there's actually some really cool, um, agricultural, um, applications that have come Mm -hmm. out um surrounding you know just 
sensors monitoring crops for humidity and water or, uh-huh. you know, cows, um, tracking animals and livestock and that type of thing. So you get some pretty interesting stuff doing it. Okay. Now, how did you get involved doing that? Um, you know, it's, I kind of fell into it. Um, I, I, I drove a FedEx truck for a few years and then one of my buddies, uh, helped me get into a large telecom corporation, uh, doing sales that way. And then okay. I've just kind of stuck with it for the past five or six years. So, okay. Very good. Well, so, so you've got that full-time job and then you've got, you've got hunt country wildlife removal on the side. Why did you start a side business? Why did this begin? Um, so it kind of started with me personally. Um, so we, we, we got our chickens and everyone knows that foxes love chickens. Yeah. So, um, that's kind of where it kicked off for me. Um, and then, uh, I started helping, you know, friends and neighbors kind of deal with nuisance wildlife, uh, issues. And then mm-hmm. it's just kind of snowballed, um, from there. Yeah, that's interesting. Nobody knows better than me that foxes love chickens. I am battling them constantly at my place, constantly. Right. Yeah. You know, so that's, you know, just um, I, I started doing it and it was more um, more or less. I was just kind of doing it for, for free, um, really, to start just to gain experience, learn about the animals and everything. Mm-hmm. But um, in our area, there's a lot of rapid growth. Uh, there's a lot of farms that are being sold, unfortunately, and being turned into housing developments. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, when you encroach on, you know, the animals habitat, they don't right. have anywhere to go. And, you know, everyone loves backyard chickens. So the foxes have all these local KFCs that they can hang out at. And so that's <laughs> where it, it, it turned into it for me. Uh, okay. That's how I got started. Okay. Yeah. So everyone's got chickens, but everyone's got foxes and that's where the business springs up. Hey, that's great. That's- you, you, uh, you recognized a need in your area and you're filling it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, okay. So very interesting. you started with that. Now I want to ask you when you get calls from people, um, well, what's the average backyard, you know, what's the average size of the backyard flock where you're at? So, you know, it really depends. Loudoun, Loudoun County, everyone says it should be split into two different counties because it's a very large county and you mm-hmm. have you have suburbia on one side and then there's a they kind of drew a line down the middle of it and then there's there's eastern Loudoun and western Loudoun. Okay. So western Loudoun, you, you know, you could be dealing with farmers who are trying to do a commercial, op- you know, commercial farming or, or, or just have, you know, the, they're at the farmer's markets and they have 50, 60 chickens. And then when you go east, I mean, you could be dealing with as little as five chickens, okay. you know, just somebody on quarter acre or acre who just kind of wants, you know, the fresh egg. So it's 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 quite the uh, drastic difference depending on where you're at in mm-hmm. the county. So when somebody calls you and they realize that they need your services, they realize that there's a fox getting their chickens, do they generally lose like all five or all ten of the chickens they have all in one fell swoop or is it like one at a time slowly disappearing? So it's... I will say that depends on the type of uh, the time of year. Okay. Um, you know, if it's a fox just out hunting, passing through the area, you know, maybe it's winter time or, or, or fall, you know, they'll take one or two, you know, possibly, and then they'll move on. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people don't have problems with that. They realize if you free range your chickens long enough, a hawk or a raccoon or a fox is going to come by and grab one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, you know, where it really comes in is in, in the springtime and summer, where those foxes, they're starting to ramp up, you know, whether they've, they've had the babies or they're teaching the babies now how to hunt, um, you know, they'll come in and they'll, you know, they'll come in and they'll wipe out a whole flock. And, you know, when that happens, um, that's kind of where I get called in um, to, to try to just at least help help stop them from doing that and, and maybe reinforce the coop a little bit to prevent any any further uh, loss. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, and I've had, I've had it both ways where – You've got a fox come in, it gets one, and I've we found like up to eight just laying out in our pasture before that have been yep. killed, yep. and and yep. it's frustrating, man. It makes you angry. It makes you not like foxes very much. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's, especially for the people, um, you know, they're trying to run a, a business. Like uh, one guy I was helping out, he had a, a a food a food truck business, and he did you know barbecue chicken and this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, one year he lost over 50 chickens. Man. Um, and it was impacting his bottom line, right. you know? So I, I don't think anybody goes, wants to go and just take out a fox right. um, for the heck of it. But at the same time, when it's impacting the ability for you to feed your family and make money, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's where the, the need comes in. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, because I don't dislike foxes. They're a beautiful animal. 
Uh, they're fun right. to watch. They've got personalities, but yeah, you come into conflict with them like that. And something needs That's to be right. done. So, okay. So we know, we know how you discovered the business. We know how you got started, but, a lot of people discover the need for something and never start a business. What was different about you where you said, well, there's a need here and I'm actually going to do something about it. I'm going to do this extra work, this extra side hustle. Sure. So for me, um, you know, obviously we have our farm, so you can never have too much money when you're trying to run, you know, <laughs> right. you have your, your house and then you're trying to buy chickens and, and then, you know, it start. you know, chickens are the gateway drug, right? Everybody knows that you get the chickens and then you get the rabbits. And now, now we're talking about goats and, and pigs and everything else. So uh-huh. obviously, you know, the extra money was um, a, a big factor. Um, you know, for me, I think that's kind of where it started, but then at the same time, I think, I think it's kind of your time too. you know, when you're going out and you're doing it for a hobby or, or you're just doing it to help people, um, that's one thing, but when you count up the amount of time that you're putting into this and you're, you're driving out to the location, you're setting traps, you're talking with the landowners, you're helping, you know, time is money. And mm-hmm. so, you know, every, everybody's, you know, if you do it just for fun, then, you know, you know, trapping is a hobby or, or conservation or, you know, for the fur, that's completely understandable. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're doing the nuisance work, it really, you know, the time adds up. So yeah. that's kind of both of those time and time and money um, kind of is what pushed me over the edge to, to start doing it as a business. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. So um, it's an extra source of income um, that's helping you to, well, I love things that kind of do two things at once. So in your case, it's helping you deal with your own foxes, but it's also helping you develop and build and support your farm. Yes. And that's correct. Um, and I think a, a, a third aspect of that is just, you know, helping the farming community. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you have families and, and their kids are in 4-H and they raise these prized birds or, or, you know, they're raising sheep, they're raising cows and you get a coyote or you get a fox or something comes in and takes out that, that, that chicken or that, that lamb or, mm-hmm. or what have you, you know, it, it, it really, you know, puts a hurting on the kids. And so I think, you know, from that aspect, I've been able to meet a lot of great farmers, a lot of great people out in the community doing it as well. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm a people person. I, I could talk to people all day. Um, so, you know, that's another great aspect of it is just getting out there meeting the people in your, in your community and, mm-hmm. and helping them with something that, you know, they might not have the time or the ability to take care of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask selfishly before we move on to the rest of your business about a little bit more about foxes. So, uh, sure. the, the three types of traps that I've seen used on YouTube to catch them are, of course, the leg hold, the snare, and then the live animal trap. What uh, do you do? You use something other than those three, or what are your favorite of those three? Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, the leg hold is uh, my favorite trap just okay. because um, it catches the fox a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you can kind of place it wherever you want to. Um, I do use snares. Um, you know, Virginia has some pretty strict regulations around using snares. Um, and then, you know, you have the live trap. It kind of depends where I'm at, what trap I'll use. Um, but I have used all three of those. Um, the fourth trap that not a lot of people know about is a trap called the collarum. So just how okay. it sounds, C-O-L-L-A-R, like collar, um, U-M. And what that is, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's a trap with a, a collar that's hidden in the dirt and the fox or the coyote will reach down and they bite the bait that you have. And when they bite and pull it, it will actually shoot a collar really? around their head, like a dog collar and hold them. Um, and it's a great application for use in urban environments where, you know, if you can't really use a, a, a leg hold or a snare. You're mm-hmm. worried about catching somebody's pet this would not injure the animal or, 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 you know, potentially harm them in any way. So that's, that's a fourth way that you can, you can catch them. That's interesting. How does it, does it use a spring? How does it shoot? It, it? does. It's, it's very, when, when I first got it, um, I felt like I needed a degree in rocket science to put the thing together and then set it, you know, footholds are pretty easy, you know, you just kind of yeah. press them down and set the dog. Um, this, you had to piece it together. Um, there's a mouthpiece that goes on it. Um, you know, you have to have the collar with the, with the, um, it's, it's attached to these two, um, hands, if you will, that kind of come out and cradle it. And then you had to put it down in the dirt. There's a whole thing uh, behind it, but, uh, it, it works great. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a little bit trickier to get in the ground and everything, but it's, it's, uh, it's phenomenal invention. Yeah. That's interesting. So it shoots out this collar and it's catching animals as large as coyotes. 
Yeah. So depending on the animal you're trying to get, you use a different collar. So, you okay. know, they'll have a, they'll have like a, a, it's basically a, um, a loop kind of like a snare, but it just doesn't cinch down all the way. Um, okay. so you'll have, you know, a fox sized loop or a, a coyote sized loop. Um, and then, yeah, you, you basically fold, you fold the trap o- away from you and the mouthpiece is sticking out of the dirt and, and it's shaped like a T and you put bait inside and they'll, they'll walk over and they'll grab it. Um, and if you go to the website, Collar him, um, it ha- he has great videos on there showing it um, and, and they'll pull that. And when it does, it, that releases the spring and it just snaps back and shoots the uh, collar right around their head. And then as they pull away, it tightens the collar, but obviously leaves them enough room to where they're unharmed. Interesting. Now, what what happens if you've got it set for fox, but a coyote takes the bait? Um. So I haven't run into that issue but i'm not sure i mean i think it would depend on the size of a coyote if it were a little smaller and the loop could get around its head i'm Mm -hmm. sure it would be fine um you you know obviously if you were using a coyote loop for a fox you might get lucky and get the fox um yeah you know so i I think it just kind of depends you know the size of the loop and the size of the animal at that point but that is interesting okay so i'm gonna have to look into that one and is it, do you have to be, because you're, you're baiting it with food, so does that mean you can be, I guess, more kind of haphazard about where you set it up? Um, yeah, you you could. I mean, the the collar works in a way where it, it doesn't, I guess you could say it doesn't really matter where you put it, but there is kind of a, a science to it. So mm-hmm. you, you want it to be on a hill or a, a, a slope. Okay. Um, so that way, you know, like you put it on the slope and then that way the animal's head is kind of, you know, their nose is kind of level with the bait, you know, it doesn't go flat from the ground. And then when it's on that slope, it's also giving you that extra leverage. So that way, you know, the, the, the loop doesn't have to be flat on the ground and do a full 180 to get over the animal's head. You know, if you already have it on that 45 degree angle on that hill, or that slope, mm. then it, it just gives you a little bit of an advantage when they pull on that thing to release it. So you, you can put it anywhere, but there are some tricks that make your success, you know, your catch rate go up. Interesting. Okay. Very interesting. And now if you use a snare, does the snare automatically kill the animal? Um, so you can use two different types of snares. Um, and in Virginia, all of ours have a, uh, it's, it's a, um, you can use a snare that kills the animal, but um, you can also use what's called a cable restraint okay. and uh, a snare will instantly, you know, kill, kill the animal. Um, a cable restraint typically has a, a lock or a catch on it, kind of like the collar room to where if the animal goes through, um, you know, it'll catch them around the neck, but it mm-hmm. won't kill them. Um, that's, you know, you can use snares in Virginia, but I prefer the, the cable restraint just because I do trap a lot of farms in, in some urban areas. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I try to be as careful as possible, especially with people's pets and livestock, yeah. you know, rolling around. If you're out in Wyoming in the middle of nowhere and, and you know, it's just coyote central, I think that's the way to go. Um, being in suburbia, I kind of try to take the extra precaution and just, you know, use something with like a cable restraint. That's interesting. You you used Wyoming in the middle of nowhere as your example. It sounds to me like you've watched Trapper Jake. <laughs> I do love Trapper Jake. That was an yeah. excellent movie. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was really, really good. Uh, so just for anybody out there listening who has not watched this, is it is it on Netflix or Amazon Prime? It's Amazon Prime, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think that's right. And for, uh, it is great. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And this guy is so old school. But, hey, be prepared if you're going to watch this. You've got to be comfortable with what happens to animals that get trapped. And and, and guys who are doing it for fur, uh, they're not going to shoot the animal if they don't have to, which he does not do with foxes. So, you know, this is old school, old world stuff, and this is the real world. So if you're going to watch this, just be prepared. You're going to see how it really gets done. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, that was great. I love Trapper Jake. That was a great, great, uh, I guess we'll call it a documentary, I guess. but Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really, really good. That's interesting. Okay, very interesting. So you got started with foxes. Now, is your bi- when did your business start? How many years ago was that, or how long ago was um, it? So, yeah, I would say two years ago. So, okay. you know, like I said, I, I started uh, just kind of, uh, you know, trapping for, for, for fun and to help neighbors and everything, mm-hmm. and then... Um, 
you know, my wife was pushing me. She kept saying, you need to charge, you need to charge. And, and I was kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can charge for this. You know, I don't know if I want, you know, the, uh -huh. the liability because it's not an exact science. You know, you go out and take somebody's hard earned money and the critter doesn't show up for, for a week or two. <laughs> right. I can put some pressure on you, you know. Right. So I said, oh, I'll start charging. And then word just got out, um, you know, and, uh, you know, now it's not just foxes anymore. It's coyotes, it's raccoons, it's groundhogs. Okay. Um, you know, it, so it's kind of snowballed from there. But um, I think the turning point for me was I, uh, I actually helped a golf course out and um, I didn't I hadn't even given them my rate and they gave me a rate that was um, well above what I was actually charging. OK. Um, and, then, and then I realized, you know, they were like, look, we have, you know, the, the foxes were tearing up the golf course. They were stealing people's golf balls after oh, they wow. hit them. Um, they were digging up the, the greens. They were digging up the sand pits. I mean, they were just wreaking havoc on this place. And uh, I went in there and pulled um, about 10 foxes out in a week and a half. Hmm. And um, that's, that's when it, you know, and I was, I went and bought a, I went and bought an ATV. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when it, the wheels kind of started turning like, uh -huh. you know, people are willing to pay, you know, for the service um, and, and as long as it's done correctly and legally and ethically. And so um, that's kind of where it, it clicked for me and I've been doing it ever since. Well, you said something there that is unbelievably interesting to me. So I've got fox problems on my place. You right. said that on the golf course, the foxes were actually stealing the golf balls from people. They were. Um, so I, I, I was talking with the, uh, the, the golf course, you know, maintenance director and guys would hit the, the golf ball, you know, they tee off and it, you know, it land, you know, down the fairway and, and uh -huh. the foxes would actually run out grab the golf ball and run away and they followed um they actually followed one um for a little bit and they were able to find him and he had a stash of about 20 golf balls underneath this bridge um and, and they were just i don't know if they thought they were toys or small birds or, or you know I, I have no idea eggs? but they were just or, the, yeah eggs maybe they were just stealing golf balls um they were stealing uh the neighbor's tennis shoes um they they love shoes so there yeah. were shoes all over the golf course because they'd run and steal the the shoes um and then they'd find the you know the uh, random chicken out on the golf course that a fox may have brought over so it was it was really wreaking havoc on the uh, uh on the players and, and and the maintenance director there too because they, they were causing thousands of dollars worth of damage just from digging up the greens looking for mice and everything else so um but yeah the, the golf hmm. ball thing was pretty funny well, that, so that's so strange that you say that because I am in the midst right now of a fox problem. And it seems like for the last three years, I'm always in the midst of one. But uh, I'm irrigating our pasture. We Our farm's kind of separated by a creek. And on the house side of the creek, I'm irrigating that pasture right now. So this morning is the second morning in a row I've gone out to irrigate and I found a golf ball on our pasture. And there's no rhyme or reason of why, why it's there. Could I mean, be a fox. <laughs> I don't. That is the strangest Thing. We have a golf course about a mile away, and there's a canal that runs from that golf course to our place, uh, and it just runs along the boundary of that golf course, and then our and then our place, and and foxes and coyotes can run that canal. That would be bizarre if foxes yeah, it, are dropping would, golf balls. It would not surprise me at all. That is funny. Well, it may help me solve the mystery where these golf balls are coming from. <laughs> that is really strange. Okay, so. You're now, you've expanded now, so foxes, coyotes, groundhogs, and then there was one other thing you mentioned that I, I lost. Oh, uh, raccoons. And raccoons, okay. Yeah. So how did you wind up expanding beyond what you were originally going after? Um, you know, it was, it was more like based on the client need, you know, like people knew that I had, you know, helped other people out with foxes, and then there, it just started to kind of branch out, hey, you know, I have a raccoon issue or I, do you do groundhogs? You know, I had a farmer, you know, you know, ask me about the coyotes. Mm -hmm. So it started out with foxes. And then as, you know, word got out, it was really just word of mouth and people talking to people. And then I'd get phone calls. Um, yesterday I had a phone call about a bat. So that was first okay. for me. Um, I just think it's one of those things where, you know, you start doing it and then people find you and then, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the need kind of drives the animals that you start taking care of, you know. That's interesting. Now, I live in Idaho. We don't have anything that we call groundhogs. We do have what we call rock chucks, and they're, yes. si they're simply just a marmot. What is, is a groundhog yeah, right. a marmot? It is, yeah. It's, okay. it's the rock chuck, the wood chuck, however you want to call it. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so same deal. Yeah, very familiar with those. Now, that's interesting. I shoot all of the rock chucks off of our place, but if I could trap them, I would. How do you trap How do you trap a, a groundhog? So there's a couple different ways, and a lot of this depends on state regulation. Um, so, for example, the, the easiest way is to use a conibear trap um okay. and that's basically i call them giant mouse traps there's two mm -hmm. giant springs it's a square they come in various sizes and you can set it you put it in front of the hole the woodchuck the rock chuck will walk through it and um you know that's it's a done deal you know you don't need any bait you can set up multiples very quickly um it just depends on your state if they'll let you do that or what size um what size trap they'll let you use. Like in Virginia, I think the law is seven inches by seven inches, mm -hmm. which is a 220. Um, so, you know, they come in, you know, various sizes, 160, 220. 220 is a great size or a 160. 330s you use for like beaver and otter. Mm -hmm. Those are really big. Um, but that's that's the most efficient way to do it because you don't have to mess with cage traps and bait and all that. Um, you can use cage traps. Um, I use cage traps a lot and I have several cage traps out right now for them. Um, you know, if people have small dogs or barn cats or mm -hmm. something around, you don't want them sticking their head into that trap because, um, they won't come back from it. So right. cage traps are also an excellent, um, an excellent idea. And then you can use footholds as well. I know plenty of guys who use footholds, you know, just like you would for a Fox, they stake it down right in front of the hole. The woodchuck will walk out into the foothold and get caught. And then you can take care of them from there. So those are the, mm. you know, those are the three most common methods. Some guys snare them. Uh, I haven't had much luck with that because their head's so low to the ground. But yeah. um, the, the the you know cage trap, you know um, foothold or or the the conibear is my three favorite ways to okay. to get them. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to try. Yeah, I couldn't use the conibear where I'm at. Too many people with dogs up and down the canal where they're all at. But a foothold, I yeah. could try a foothold. Yep, foothold would work. And then, you know, the cage trap. Uh, I love the ones that open from either end because they can. you can get them coming or going. Uh -huh. um, if you don't have those, you know, they're a little bit more expensive. So if you can get the cage trap where it only opens on the one end, uh -huh. uh, just, just do them back to back where, you know, the, the, the door is facing the, the cage or the door is facing the, the entry hole. And then the, um, you know, the other door is facing, you know, out into the field mm -hmm. um, that way, you know, they can't really, the wire, they can't really see it. And, and that kind of creates that tunnel for them. Um, and you can, you can get them that way too. Mm -hmm. If, if you only have like the single door cage trap. So that's just a, a good, good way to get them too. Do you need, so how much bigger does the cage trap need to be than the actual, the groundhog, like double its size or? Um, you know, you'd be surprised. I've caught giant groundhogs in like small cages. Um, but mm. I, I typically just use the standard, like, you know, just standard have a heart size. I, I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I've caught them in really small ones, but usually it's been a small groundhog. Um, you know, typically once the animal feels that cage or anything on their back, they kind of get nervous and they'll start backing out. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the bigger, the better, but just the standard have a heart size, you know, typically they have like a picture of a raccoon or groundhog on the side. You know, okay. I think it's, uh, I think it's a medium trap because the, they have small, medium and large. I think the large is more geared towards like, you know, fox, coyote, bobcat. I think it's a, a medium, but yeah, you can get them at any rural king. Um, you, you know, even like Lowe's or Home Depot or, uh -huh. or you know, trap sites. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So I've never, I've tried to catch them, but I've tried to bait them with grass, but that's the wrong approach. I need to be sticking this trap right by their hole. That's, that's typically what I do. Um, you know, th they're pretty, you know, you can funnel them in. So if I get a cage trap, you know, if I'm pretty positive, they're in the hole, I'll put the cage trap down put two logs or, or two, two by four, you know, two, two by sixes or rocks, whatever on either side of the hole. Mm -hmm. So when they come out of the hole, the only direction they are, they, they're lazy. They, they don't want to climb over that. They'll go right into the cage. Half the time you don't even have to use bait. Um, if you can put the cage trap in the right, the right place. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and when you're using a leg hold for a groundhog, do you, do you even have to bury that thing? Um, I never have, um, they're not trap shy, like a fox or a right. coyote. Um, so you can pretty much just set it, put it in front of the, I, mean, I would make sure that it's kind of bedded solidly. You don't want it to wobble and miss him, but mm -hmm. you really don't need to hide it. And that's just, that's going to be a smaller leg hold trap than like what you would use for a fox or coyote, right? Yeah, that's correct. You know, you could use a smaller one. Um, I've caught them in, in, in fox and, and, coyote traps actually you know as an incidental catch you know i wasn't going for them but uh -huh. they wandered in 
held them just fine. But yeah, you could you could use a smaller you know a smaller trap. Huh, that's super interesting. Okay, I got a lot of things I need to get busy with trying out here. <laughs> All right, it sounds like your business has grown basically based on word of mouth but you've got the shirt and so you're branding yourself in other ways what what are all the different ways you're using to market and brand yourself sure so um facebook was a huge um was a huge one for me um what i started doing was joining these local um chicken facebook pages chicken groups basically backyard chickens um and so that's kind of how mm -hmm. that's that was the first way um, and then I started, um, like a, a business, uh, Facebook page. So it's funny. I started out as Fox man. Um, it was just kind of something I threw together. Everybody was calling me the Fox man because okay. of the foxes, but then I didn't want to be pinned down to one animal. So that's kind of where I came up with the hunt country. Okay. Um, the, the neighborhood we live in is called hunt country estates. So okay. I did that. So Facebook is a big one. Um, you know, business cards, um, are, is another big one. And then community boards, um, you mm -hmm. know, if, if it's allowed, I, I'll put a flyer up, you know, for nuisance animal removal. You know, I'm further out in the country. Everybody seems to have a need for it. Um, so I've done that. And then, yeah, hats, T-shirts, you know, you bump into somebody, you know, you never, you know, pass them a business card or they see the name. Mm -hmm. um, you, you never know what might happen. And, and right. lately it's just been blowing up. You know, before everybody was just kind of messaging me through, uh, you know, Facebook Messenger. Now people are actually finding me online and, and calling my cell phone so that so much that I've. I actually started putting my my business name on my voicemail so people know that they've reached me. Is so that it's, right? it's okay. been Yeah, it's been pretty cool. That is great. Now, do you have aspirations of becoming a full-time entrepreneur or do you want to keep it as a side business? Yeah, you know, it's something that I have been throwing around actually. It's funny you mentioned that for the past couple of months. Uh this summer, I think just with everybody being home, everybody's interacting with wildlife a lot more mm -hmm. and I have just stayed busy day after day and i have talked with some professional trappers and asked kind of you know you know guys who are doing it full time i should mm -hmm. say what they're charging and everything and um i would love to if i could pull it off uh, absolutely um, i love working with animals i love talking to people it's it's kind of it's a perfect fit for me um i guess it would just all come down to the financial aspect of it you know mm -hmm. um we all have bills we have to pay and whatnot. So if I could, if I could pay the bills doing the full time trapping, I definitely would. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, that's how I got started. I know you and I just met, and you just discovered the podcast. But uh, that's how I got started back in 2012. I started my very first business, which was actually Pocket Go for extermination, and that grew and did really well. And I left my full time job and became a full time entrepreneur at that point. And that's kind of the vessel that led me to being a full-time podcaster. So uh, it's interesting how it can all work when you're when you get good at something and you're filling a need in your community. That's awesome. Yeah, I would love that. So we'll we'll see what the future holds for for Hunt Country. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, good for you. Okay, so let's talk mistakes. If somebody listening to this is like, you know what, I love to do this stuff. I want to start this business. They're off in Kentucky. They're off in Indiana or wherever they might be. What are some mistakes that you made as you've been developing this business that you would tell them, hey, don't do this. You might as well skip this step and move on to this one. Um, you know, I would definitely say charge something. I think that was one of my biggest mistakes. Okay. You know, your time is valuable. If you're going to start, if, it, if it's nuisance wildlife and, and you're, you're helping somebody, you know, out, remove a, a groundhog from under their basement steps, you know, you mm -hmm. know charge something charge them don't don't do it for free i did it for free for such a long time um you know and I, I i look back and i'm like wow i really really could have been charging so if you're gonna do the nuisance aspect of it i would say charge okay um you, you know at least you know put 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 gas in your tank you know get used to that whole mm -hmm. you know you know dealing with the customer um other than that as far as mistakes trapping is a is a mistake making game i mean um <laughs> you, you know you you just got to go out there and, and do it. Um, you, you know, I didn't have anybody teaching me. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a ton of YouTube videos. I didn't have a mentor. If you can go out and get a mentor, um, I would highly recommend that. Um, but that that's kind of what I would say is, you know, charge, you know, get a mentor. And then just, you know, from the business aspect, um, get, you know, I'd say get liability insurance. You never know what might happen. You know, okay. I, I haven't had, I haven't had anything happen where I've caught somebody's dog or something accidentally. I'm always very careful, but you just never know 
the people around you, you know, the homeowner or the landowner might be okay with it, but you never know what might happen. So, you know, make sure you're covered. You don't want to start doing this as a, as a, as a hobby or, or try and start something and then something were to happen, then you were to be right. liable and they come after you. So I would say those are probably my, my top three things, okay. you know, now, um, what, why, why do you think you had that tendency or why were you hesitant to charge people? Um, I guess in the back of my mind, number one, I didn't think people would pay for it, you know? And I think number two, I was always in it for the land access. So in Northern Virginia, there is no state land. There is no park land. It's all private, private land. It's very difficult to get a hunting spot, a fishing spot, mm -hmm. a, a trapping spot. And so I was bartering is what I was doing. Okay. I will take care of your foxes or your coyotes. If I can come back in the fall and shoot a deer, or shoot a turkey. Okay. Um, and I'd kind of gotten into that mindset. Um, and, and, you know, or, or I'd just say, Oh, I worked for tips, you know, and people would kick me 50 bucks here or, you know, Bass Pro gift card or something. Mm -hmm. So I think it was my mindset. Um, and I think that's really half the battle, honestly, is just changing your mindset and being, I can do this. Um, you know, my time is valuable. I am going to mm -hmm. start charging for that. But I, I think that's, for me, that's what it was. It was a, it was a mindset thing where I just didn't think it was, you know, I didn't think people would pay for it. And, and if they did, I didn't think they would, you know, pay as much as, as they might. So, and is this the first entrepreneurial thing that you've ever done? Um, yes. Uh, this is the first thing that I've, I've ever gone out on my own and done. My, my wife is very entrepreneurial. She's, okay. she's done a million different things. Um, but for me, it was always just, um, you know, I, I just didn't have, have time or I didn't find anything that I really liked. Um, the nice thing about trapping was I, I enjoyed it, but uh -huh. I could also make money doing it and kind of put it back into the business or back into the hobby at first. Um, so that's kind of why I did it. Yeah, it's interesting when you start off as a hobby. So for me, when I started my business, it was not a hobby. It was not a hobby. I was looking for a business in agriculture that I thought was needed, could make money, and could ultimately replace my income. And so I started it. And for me, that felt like a huge risk because I didn't know if it was going to work. I had to outlay a bunch of capital. And it's money I would have never spent on this equipment or on this marketing or website or anything like that if I wasn't starting a business. But in your case all the equipment and things like that, you were buying that anyway. So did you feel any sense of risk when you were starting your business? Um, I, I didn't because it was one of those things where, you know, I, I would go out and maybe do a fox job and make some money. Mm -hmm. And then I would buy more fox or coyote traps with that money. And mm -hmm. then, you know, if I went out and somebody asked me for, you know, groundhogs, I would charge them, you know, I'd buy what I needed. I would charge them to basically cover the cost. So there wasn't a whole lot of risk because whatever I charged, I was just putting back into the business. There wasn't really any risk for me because I was I was using the money that I would get on the jobs to, and just put it mm -hmm. back into my hobby. So, you know, the first year, year and a half, I was just doing it for the fur or for the land. And so, you know, when people would give me money, I would use that to turn around and go buy traps. You know, if it was a fox or coyote job and I got money off that, I would go buy more fox or coyote traps. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a groundhog job, I would go get, you know, some, some, some cages, you know, if it was a, if it was a skunk, I would go get a skunk trap. So there was, there was, you know, very low risk for me. Plus I, I have my full-time job and that was always kind of my safety net where if I was a terrible trapper and it didn't work out, you know, I still had that to fall back on. So, okay. Now are you, when you catch a fox or, or let me just ask you this about everything you're trapping for other people, are you relocating it or are you dispatching everything? So I have to dispatch it, unfortunately. Okay. Um, you know, in, in the state of Virginia, the law states that you, you can relocate it um, on that original landowner's property. So, you know, if they have, you know, 500 acres and you catch a groundhog under their house, you can put it on your ATV and drive it to the you know okay. car into their property and release it. Otherwise, you got to dispatch it. And there's just not a lot of there. You know, like I said, it's all private land here. A lot of it's, mm -hmm. you know, smaller parcels. So unfortunately they get dispatched. Okay. And now, and being selfish again, when it comes to the foxes, uh, you've got a nuisance fox that's killing people's chickens. How many traps are you setting out to catch that fox? Um, it depends on the setup. You know, if it's, if it's a, if it's a small property and you can kind of tell where they're coming or going, you know, like I had one lady who was basically in the middle of a town, you know, mm -hmm. in her backyard. I set one trap by the chicken coop and managed to get them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're trapping further out in the country and, and you're not really sure where they're going to come from, 
you know, like I was trapping a, a 400 acre spot, you mm-hmm. know, I'll put out 20, 30 traps just to cover. Mm. So it, it does kind of depend on the setup and, and, you know, how many foxes that there might be or, or, or where you can even put the trap. Sometimes you're just limited by the sheer mm-hmm. amount of this is my backyard. You got to catch them in here somewhere type deal. You know, there's mm-hmm. not like a big open field where you can kind of pinpoint where they're, where they're, right. where they're at. Huh. Okay. Interesting. So it's uh don't limit yourself by the number of traps you have, but I guess be limited by the, uh, the place that you're trapping on. Yeah, there's 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 an old saying that says if it's good for one trap, it's good for two. If it's good for two, it's good for three. Okay. You know, um, if I if I can put one down and it's a good spot, you're good enough to catch one. You can catch two. It's happened more than once. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you go on YouTube, there's some guys out there who do some serious numbers and they'll catch doubles and triples. Um, you know, it just depends on the spot and the population. But yeah, you, it, it's definitely good to put at least. You know, I'll, I'll try to do at least two um, mm. if I can. Now, you know, uh, so I always wonder this. You know, we'll see a fox, and I wonder what percentage of the foxes we're dealing with I've actually just seen. So in your experience, uh, in your area, you're kind of semi-suburban, semi-rural, semi-urban area. If if somebody's seeing a fox, how many are you trapping? Um, <sighs> hmm. That's... That's a bit difficult to guess. I mean, okay. there's always at least two, right? You have the male and the female. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depending on the time of year, they'll have three or four uh, uh, kits running around with them as they get older, you know, until they kick them out of the den. Um, so it could be two, um, you know, territories. They're, they're, they are territorial. Um, where we're at, there's so much food and, and there's so many places they can go. You know, like that golf course example. It's a 60 acre golf course and we pulled, I think, 10 out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it does, again, kind of depend on, on on the land and if you're, you know, if it's Western Loudon or Eastern Loudon, okay. going back to the example. But I would definitely say you're dealing with at least two. Um, could be more, you know, if, if, you know, your house is in the middle of a, you know, a, a, a farming area and there's mm-hmm. multiple fields, multiple places for them to roam, their territories could be bigger and they could be kind of overlapping a bit so i think it all kind of depends it's kind of hard to pin down how many are are you catching just take foxes how many are you catching on an annual basis do you think um so last year was the first year that i super focused on trapping them Mm -hmm. um, because before i would just kind of call them in and 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 shoot them Mm -hmm. um and i got 20 uh well 20 that i put up um some of them had mange and things that, and I had to actually release one. So I would say overall, probably 25 is what I, I did last year, which mm-hmm. um, it's, it's not a huge number. I, like it was my first year specifically trapping for Fox. Um, but I was, I was super proud of it, you know, mm-hmm. um, especially coming from, you know, not trapping them before. Yeah. Now when you're, when you're charging your customers, what do you, do you refund? Do you still charge? What do you do if you don't catch anything? Yeah, so I typically don't charge them um, just because I I feel like it's not an exact science and and I would hate to take somebody's money and not deliver a product. You know, if you Mm -hmm. buy something and it's defective, you want to return it, you want to get your money back, right? So that's Mm -hmm. kind of a similar thing for me. It's a risk I take, but then again, I'm not doing it full time. And typically the people will kick me, they kick me something because they're like, hey, I appreciate you coming out. Mm -hmm. Here's money for gas. You know, so they'll kick me 20, 30 bucks. And, and mm-hmm. that's pretty much good enough for me. Um, that's kind of my MO. I, I should probably do something, you know, work it in there. But I, I haven't gotten to that. You know, I haven't. A lot of times I wind up catching them. I've only had one or two times where I really haven't gotten anything. So mm-hmm. um, it's it's kind of is it is what it is at that point. And is there a seasonality factor to this? Like, are you busier at certain times of the year? Yeah, I would say um, – you know, obviously, I try to I try to do as much trapping as I can in the winter because that's when the fur is good. That's where you can actually take them and turn them into a usable mm-hmm. usable product and you know really do right by the animal. Um, you know, when springtime picks up, you know they get super ravenous and and they start killing a bunch of chickens and obviously they have you know babies. So you got to kind of take that into consideration. I try not to do much during then, but if somebody's absolutely getting destroyed, you know, Mm -hmm. I'll do something, but I would say spring and winter, you know, I I don't want to deal with them in the summer. You know, it's, it's so hot. 
they got fleas and ticks and, and I'm definitely allergic to poison ivy. So yeah. <laughs> I try to stay, I try to, you know, summer I try to fish and stay out of the woods maybe, you know, and then, uh-huh. and then just go after them when it's a little cooler out. So it's interesting what you said about the spring. I'm, a, I'm my assumption is if they've got pups in the den, you're not wanting to take them because it, it, you know, it orphans the pups who are relying on them for food. Is that the reason? Yeah, that's, cor- that's correct. I, I don't really, you know, I realize sometimes you have to take out a nuisance mm-hmm. fox. Um, a lot of times it's the male. Um, you know, he'll go out, hunt, kill 10, and he'll mm-hmm. bring them back to the den, and he'll stash them all around the den for the for the female so she doesn't have to go out and hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you're, you know, if you take him out, a lot of times the problem resolves itself. The female may have to do some hunting, but, you know, I feel like they can still mm-hmm. get get through it. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, you know, I always say I'm not out to to, to you know, wipe out the family tree, so to speak, but Mm -hmm. I'll trim a few if I have to. So it's one of those Mm -hmm. things I try to use judgment. Um, You know, I love animals. I love foxes too. So, you know, I I don't want to cause any animal to to suffer unnecessarily. So, you know. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to sound very callous with this question, but, right. But I think I know the answer, but I, I, you're going to know it better (laughs) than me. So okay, you got pups in the den you don't want to take their parents away. And I understand the rationale behind that. But right. if you, but if you're eventually going to wind up trapping those pups anyway, what, uh, here's the callous part of the question. What's the difference? Right. Yeah. No. And I agree with that. Um, you know, it, it, if you're taking them out, you know, if you're doing it for, for population control, I take them all out. I've done that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I I'll say it outright. I've, I've taken out a whole, you know, if you want to call it a, a family of foxes from, from, from pups, you know, up to the, uh, you know, the, the adults, um, you know, I, I've done it with coyotes, um, too, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, just this past weekend I caught two, I mean, they were, they were pretty fully grown, you know, they were about the size of a border collie or a small German shepherd, mm-hmm. but they were, you know, you could tell they were pups. Um, you know, population control has to be done. It's a huge part of conservation. Um, if you don't do it, they get overcrowded, they get mange, they're miserable. Um, there's no food. So mm-hmm. I do believe in population control. Um, you know, and that's where I say, you know, I try to, I try to be as, as ethical as possible, but you know, if somebody says, look, I want them gone, they're, they're all going to be gone okay. at the end of the day. Okay. This is fascinating stuff, Peter, and I could go on and on and on, obviously, because I, it's, it's fresh on my mind. If folks out there listening, if they if they wanted to contact you, ask a question, or obtain your services, how should they go about doing that? Sure. So um, I'm on Facebook, um, you know, Hunt Country Wildlife Removal. Um, I'm on Instagram as well. Um, and then my phone number is on my Facebook page, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to give that out as well. If anybody has any questions, you know, you know, feel free to reach out. I'll help however I can. That's awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you coming on. I'll, I'll put all those links on the show notes uh, for today's episode so you can all find those. And thank you so much for uh, for sharing this with us. It's been a wealth of information. Well, hey, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I love to promote trapping. You know, a, a lot of times it gets a, a, a bad rap um, out in the world today, but um, it really is a, a huge part of conservation. So anything I can do to, to show it in a positive light and, and show what we do, um, you know, I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. All right. Thanks, Matt. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. Special thanks to Peter Dalton for coming on today. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.